Hi, my name is Jacob Taylor and I'm a mathematics teacher at the high school and college level and I want to talk about a problem that has been making the rounds on social media uh, and it is a common core subtraction problem and it's the problem that you see right here and I've been seeing a lot of comments about this problem on how it's too hard and why isn't this the method that we all learned how to subtract and I want to go over this problem a little bit because I think once it is explained maybe its value will be understood by more people because this is a really valuable method of subtraction. It's not the only method of subtraction by any means. Uh, if you're like me, the way that you probably learned how to subtract in school, and if you see this picture online, they're always side by side with the old method. The way that you probably learned it is the same way I learned it, which is when you have 32 minus 12, you stack the digits on top of each other like this, 32 minus 12. You line up the ones column and you line up the tens column, and then you just subtract straight down. So two minus two is zero, and three minus one is two, and so the answer there is 20, and look how easy that is. So this is the method that I learned subtraction, and I'll do one here in a little bit that involves uh, when you can't subtract straight down like this, but this old method is awesome. What a great way to subtract a problem, especially if a student has explained to them what's happening in the problem. Why do we subtract the ones column? Why do we subtract the tens problem? If it's explained, this is a great method of subtraction. But this new method that is being put forth, uh, or I shouldn't say being put forth, but just made popular by Common Core, because this has been around for a while, but Common Core has made it very popular. This method is outstanding. It's a really good way to subtract. A lot of the comments that I read are from people who say things like, this is way too hard. I don't understand. Why don't they just do it the old way? And I think that's a really valid concern, because if you weren't taught how to do subtraction this way, it probably barely looks like math. It's really hard to just look at this and understand. But most math is that way. Most math problems, if you've never seen it before, you're not going to be able to just look at it and figure out what's going on. When I first saw a problem like this, it took me a minute to figure out what was even going on in the problem, and I teach math. So I can only imagine someone who uh, is not super excited about math, or maybe hasn't done math in years and years. I can understand the confusion, but hopefully what I'll do today is explain to you uh, how this problem is being done, why it's being done that way, and maybe some of the uses for doing this problem. So let's start off with this one that's making the rounds, 32 minus 12, and let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. The old method is easier for doing this problem. It absolutely is easier. Look how fast that was compared to this. But the reason that the old method seems easier in this problem, the reason it is easier in this problem, is because the one's digits are the same. This is a really easy subtraction problem, even without writing it down using the old method. If I gave you 32 minus 12, I imagine 90% of you would not need a piece of paper to answer that question because when the one di ones digits are the same, the problem will end with a zero. So all you have to do is subtract the tens digits and you're done. So yeah, the old method's easier, but it's not as easy as just doing it in your head. 32 minus 12 is an easy problem to do mentally without even needing a piece of paper in the first place. So I don't want to talk about this problem because I think maybe this is a bad poster child for this example because nobody would do it this way if you gave them 32 minus 12. Hopefully nobody would do it this way if you gave them 32 minus 12. Hopefully you can do 32 minus 12 in your head or at least get kind of close to it. So let's do a little more challenging problem. Let's do a problem that will really show the benefit of this method and that is 32 minus 17. Now immediately this is a more challenging subtraction problem because the ones digits aren't the same. So before we jump into the new method, let's look at how we would do this under the old method of subtraction, which is take 32 and the 17, stack them one on top of the other and subtract, and we run into a problem immediately. 2 minus 7 can't be subtracted. Well it can, but you get a negative number. So I always learned this as borrowing. I think maybe that's the general term that's used for subtraction. I don't really like the term borrowing, by the way. Borrowing to me implies you're going to give it back. We're not really going to ever give this back, what we're about to borrow. But the problem is the top ones column is smaller than the bottoms one column. So we come over here to this three and we say, I need to borrow something from you, number three. I need to borrow 10 from the three. This is a 30, right? Because it's in the tens place. So this 30 becomes a 20. We took 10 away from the tens column. Where do we put it? Well, we put it over here in this one column. We take this two, we add 10 to it because we borrowed 10, it now becomes 12. 12 minus seven is five, two minus one is one, and look at that, there's the answer, 15 under the old method. Awesome, not too bad. We had to borrow, but still pretty easy. So let's do this same problem using this method that's being used in Common Core. Let's take 32 minus 17, and let me walk you through what is happening 
in this new method, 32 minus 17. So what I want you to notice about old school subtraction, really any subtraction, but most obvious in this method, is that if I asked you, how do you know 15 is the answer? Can you go back and check and make sure the answer is really 15? There's a great way to check your answer, and it's to work backwards. You take this answer, which is called the difference, you take the difference and you work backwards. Instead of subtracting 17, you add 17, and you want to see if 17 plus 15 gives us 32. That's how you check using subtraction. So we take the 17, we add the 15, our difference, and lo and behold, 7 plus 5 is 12, so we carry a 1, and 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, and look at that, 32, this is 32, 32 was the first number in the original problem, look, we checked the answer, it's great. The Common Core method uses this idea, it uses the idea that taking the difference and adding one of the numbers in the subtraction problem, adding these two together is going to give us the other number from the subtraction problem. These numbers are called subtrahends, by the way, uh, in case it ever comes up on Final Jeopardy. Subtrahend. I don't know who comes up with these names. But the idea is 17 plus some number should give us 32. That's what this problem is. We're asking 17 plus some number should give us 32 is the answer. So obviously we already know what the answer is. The answer is 15 because we just did it. And some people who are really familiar with math and really good at mental math could look at this problem and they could know it's 15 right away. But to an elementary school student, which is the target group for this type of problem, 15 is not an easy number to see. It's not easy to just look at that and go, boom, 15. 7 plus 5 in particular is really challenging for students that are just learning addition and subtraction. 7 plus 5 equals 12 is tough to think about in your head. So the method that we teach them for subtracting is, okay, forget about figuring out 17 plus what equals 32. Let's do 17 plus something, and let's just try to make it a nicer number. What I mean by that is if we had a number that ends in a 7, students know by this time, because they've done addition, that if you have a 7 and you add 3 to it, that you get 10. 7 plus 3 is 10. Now the reason that we want it to equal 10 is because when you have your ones column adding up into 10, it means your number is now going to end in a zero. And as we discussed earlier, numbers that end in zero are nice. Those are easy numbers to work with. So now we have 20. Remember our goal was to get up to 32. We're not to 32 yet, but we are at 20. Okay, so let's think about 20. I have 20 and I want to add something else to it, something that'll get me up to 32. Now you might be thinking, oh, it's 12. 20 plus 12 is 32, and you're right. But let's try to put it in the mindset of an elementary school child who maybe uh, doesn't see that right away, that it's plus 12. But what they hopefully will see right away, what they've had a lot of practice in, is adding 10. 20 plus 10 is 30. Adding 10 is so easy. It's so easy. You just raise the tens column by one. Piece of cake. So now we've got 30. Our goal was 32. We're still not there. We're only at 30, but we're way closer. And now... It's pretty obvious, 30 plus what is 32? Well, 30 plus 2 is 32, and look at that. Our goal was to take 17 and end up with 32, and that's what we've done. We took 17 and we ended up with 32, and the question is, what did we add to get to 32? Well, let's look at what we added. First, we added a 3, then we added a 10, and then we added a 2. So how much did we add all together? 3 plus 10 plus 2, we added a total of which was our answer. Now I know I haven't convinced some of you. Some of you were looking at this and saying, okay, well, yeah, maybe I understand it now, but I still like the old method better. So let me give you an example of when the new method is clearly superior. And let's imagine that you own a business and I come into your store one day and I buy an item from your business and the item that I buy from you costs a dollar and 32 cents. And so you ring it up at the register and you say, okay, that'll be $1.32. And I reach into my wallet and I pull out a $5 bill and two quarters. So I'm paying you $5.50. How much change should you give back to me? Now, hopefully nobody in this situation would pull out a piece of paper and do $5.50 minus $1.32. And okay, I can't do zero minus two, so let's borrow from the four. Hopefully, you would not do that with a customer waiting there for you to give them change back. Hopefully, 
uh, you would do what many people in retail do, which is count the change back to the customer. Meaning, we want to use this idea of how to check a subtraction problem by saying, okay, the cost of the item plus the amount of change I give you should equal $5.50. So the cost of the item, $1.32, plus however much change I give back to you should equal $5.50. That's how you check a subtraction problem. The answer plus the bottom subtrahend should equal the top subtrahend. That's how you check a subtraction problem. Well, I have no idea what to put here for $1.32. I know I've got $1.32, I know I need to add some stuff, and I end up with $5.50. I have no clue. But what I do know is that whatever the number is, I'm going to have to add something that ends up with a digit here. This is not the ones column anymore, it's the hundredths column, but I need this digit to be a zero, and right now this digit is a two. So what can I add to this number that will make it end with a zero? And the answer is eight cents. If I have a dollar thirty-two and I add eight cents, my total is now one dollar and forty cents. And an elementary school student might break this up even further. They might add three cents to get a dollar thirty-five and then add five cents in the next step to get a dollar forty. You'd end up in the same spot. So now I'm at a dollar forty. I still haven't gotten all the way up to 550, but I'm closer because now the digits in the last column, that hundredths column, are the same. Okay, let's work on the next column then. I've got a 4. I need it to be a 5. What do I add to 4 to get 5? Well, you add 1, but this is in the tenths column, so I'm going to add a 1 in the tenths column, which it so happens turns out to be 10 cents. So this brings me up to a dollar. I'm still not at my goal of 550, but dang, I'm close. Look, they both end in 50 cents. This one ends in a five and this one ends in a one. So I need to add a little bit more to a dollar fifty. How much more do I need to add? What do I need to add to a dollar fifty to get it up to 550? And of course the answer is four dollars. All of the columns are the same except this first column. Let's make this first column the same. So I'll add four dollars and a dollar fifty plus four dollars, lo and behold. $5.50. So I started with $1.32, I added some stuff, and I got $5.50, and the question is, how much stuff did I add to get to $5.50? So this is all the stuff I added. I added $0.08 cents and $0.10 cents and $4. So this is a total of $4 and $0.10 cents and $0.08 cents is $0.18. Cents. It's a total of $4.18. So if you uh, are a pro at this and you work in retail, you might count change back to the customer. And counting change back to the customer is whenever you have all the change you need to give them in your hand and you count it back by going one, two, three, four, and then you stack the change on top and say, and 18 cents makes 550. You count back the amount they spent, count the change back to them until it adds up to the total that they gave you, and that's counting back change. Now, you may have been thinking during this problem, this is dumb because you said right at the beginning of the problem, they put it in the register. Doesn't the register do the math for me? Yeah, sure. The register absolutely will do the math for you, but it won't do the math for me, the customer. What if the cashier makes a mistake? What if I gave them 550 and they accidentally type in 350 into the register and I get shorted $2? I want to be able to know immediately whether or not I'm getting ripped off. And I don't want to have to do it by like pulling out a piece of paper at the cash register and saying, oh, hold on just a second, I gotta do some subtraction and make sure you gave me the correct change. I wanna be able to do it mentally, and so this is a way for us to do this math mentally. To get from $1.32 to $5.50, I'm gonna need to add 18 cents to get it to the 150, and then four more dollars. This method is great for counting back change. And dealing with money, having that money literacy in math is so vital because people make mistakes. You want to be sure that whenever you pay for something and you get your change back that you're getting the correct amount of change. The fact that it works with other subtraction problems is, is awesome. Uh, and it works with money. And that's even more awesome because we're going to be using money quite a bit. Now I'm going to wrap up this video by telling you I do not think that this method should replace the more traditional subtraction method. I think they both have a place in mathematics. The traditional subtraction method is great for some problems. For example, this original problem that's floating around on the internet, 32 minus 12, I wouldn't expect anybody to solve that problem like this, although it is a good practice problem for learning this method. And I honestly wouldn't expect anybody to do it this way. I would expect most people to just do this in their head, but if you had to do it, the old method is clearly better. 
In something like this, 32 minus 17, I could see going with either method. I think they're both good. Personally, I kind of prefer this method because that's the way I think about the problem in my head. When I think 32 minus 17, I think, okay, 17 plus 5 is 22, and 22 plus 10 is 32. So I added 10 and I added 5, it's 15. When you do mental math, this is sort of a way of writing down what the thought process is for mental math. So I really like this method, and for counting back change, I mean, good lord, there's no contest. This is a crazy way to do, if you have to make change for somebody, it would just be crazy for you to do this. This is a much better way of doing it. Not only is it a better way of doing it on paper, I think, but it's the way to do it mentally, to do it in your head so you don't have to pull out a piece of paper. So I know that this method is confusing if you've learned this method, and it's unlikely I've convinced you if you learned this method to suddenly switch over to this method. If this is what is ingrained in your math brain, it's really unlikely you're going to want to switch over to this method. But hopefully this explains why we would teach it to elementary school students who do not have this method ingrained in their minds. They're both really good methods, and we should teach both of them. We should teach more than these two. As many ways as we know to subtract, we should teach all of them. We should give students as many tools as possible in order to solve these subtraction problems. Any way to subtract we know, we should be telling them how to do it because they all have uh, advantages and disadvantages in certain situations. So the more information we can give them, the better. But hopefully next time you see someone talking about this or hear someone talking about this and they say, this is so hard, I don't understand, why are we teaching this to our students, why don't they just learn the old way? Well, of course it's hard because we didn't learn how to do it this way. But when you learn how to do it this way, it's really easy. Whenever you first saw multiplication, you probably thought, this is the hardest thing I'll ever have to do in my whole life, or long division. Oh my God, long division. When you first learned long division, you probably thought, math will never get harder than this. This is so hard. But after you practice with it a little bit, it becomes second nature. And this is a really good way to sort of visualize and write down the thought process that students have when doing mental math. Mental math is so important, uh, especially for developing brains. It's really important that they learn how to do uh, mental math. It's extremely useful skill. So hopefully, even if I haven't convinced you to turn your whole life around and start using this new subtraction method, hopefully I have at least given you some insight into why this method is being taught and sort of how this method works. So if you have any questions for me, please leave them in the comments section. I'll be happy to answer any of the questions that you have.